Let us pray. God of love and God of peace and God of mercy, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have made. Thank you for how you have woke us up this morning clothed in our right mind. Thank you, Lord, for guiding our feet to this house of worship and praise one more time. For Lord, we can't thank you enough for all that you have done. And now at this preaching moment, I ask that you would allow your spirit to fall fresh on me. Allow your spirit to fall afresh on us. Lord, I ask that you would walk up and down the aisles and touch and heal and deliver as only you can. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this place. Spirit of the living God, move in me and move in us in this place. Write words into my heart. Write what you want me to say and how you want me to say it. But don't just stop there, Lord, but make us and compel us to take this word out into the world and teach others about your love and liberating power. For Lord, I cannot preach until you touch me. We cannot receive your word until you touch us. Ooh, hallelujah. Have your way. Have your way. So that without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived. We have been empowered. We have been encouraged. We have been healed. We have been delivered. But most of all, we have been redeemed when we shall leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I thank God for this wonderful opportunity. I do bring uh, you greetings from the Oakdale Covenant Church, your sister church in Chicago. And Lord knows I knew Pastor Sherwood very well. He has preached for us uh, at Oakdale on a number of occasions. And I certainly drove up today missing his larger than life self. You know, missing Pastor Sherwood. But I thank God the Lord has put you in capable hands in that of Pastor Daryl Scarborough. I thank God for him. Shanika, God bless them. Don't she look good? Amen. It's good to see Pastor Scarborough. And you know, it's easy to talk about God when you have an angel by your side. So I see his wife. Uh, and certainly to all of you who have been so generous and kind uh, to me since I have been here. Uh, Kevin, brother, where is Brother Gray and uh, Keisha? All of you all have been so kind uh, to me. Now I know I'm on a timer, so I, when Sherwood came to Oakdale, he wasn't on no timer. But uh, so I just want you to know. Let me just uh, let me just say that, okay? I just want you all to know there were no timers when Pastor Scarborough came to Oakdale. There were no timers. There was no time. It took them ten minutes to clear their throat. Amen. But, but I'm going to abide by the rules and regulations that I have been given. Can you stand up for me one minute? Can you just stand up one minute, one minute? Stand up for me one minute. Yes, that's it, that's it, all right. You can sit back down, amen, sit back down. When I, when I get to Oakdale and they say, how did it go? I'll be able to say I had them standing on their feet and I won't be, I won't be lying, amen. But I'm grateful for this wonderful opportunity and grateful for the things that God has done. Now, as Elizabeth Taylor told her many husbands, I won't keep you long, so let me get to my assignment, which is Numbers, the 13th chapter. A pastor told me you all were talking about, he was talking about vision is what you, and so I want us to lift up Numbers, the 13th chapter of Numbers and starting at the 26th verse. Numbers 13 and 26. And it reads, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregations and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we, they told him and said, we came unto the land that thou hast shown us, and surely it does flow with milk and honey, 
and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, in the cities are well fortified and greatly. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwelt in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwelt in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwelt by the sea by the coast of Jordan. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The Lord through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants and the son of Anak, which were the giants. And we were in our own sights as grasshoppers, grasshoppers, and so were there in our sight. And let me go down further. And all the people lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Pastor Mo I mean against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said unto him, Would God that we would have died in the land of Egypt, or, or would God we would die in the wilderness? And wherefore the Lord have brought us to the land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children shall be as prey and plunder. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us put together a search committee and let's get a captain and let's return to Egypt. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. I want to preach today for the time that I have been allotted this sermon entitled, What Do You See? What do you see? Now, beloved, uh, in 1990, I had the opportunity. I was a student at Harvard Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I had one year under my belt, and I went to, be, to serve uh, an internship at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York. That church was the famous church of Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., actually Adam Clayton Powell, Sr., and Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. My first day on the job, the pastor at the time, Dr. Calvin Butts, oh, Dr. Butts, who's the pastor even now, Dr. Calvin Otis Butts, uh, he took me around on my first day. He drove me around and gave me sort of a vision of the ministry. He said to me, he said, I want to show you the vision that I have for this church and for the community. Now, I want you to know, beloved, as we drove past abandoned buildings and many challenging looking people, he told me that this is our mission field. And he asked me the question, he said, young man, what do you see? Now, I thought that it may have been a trick question because it was obvious that I saw nothing at that time in Harlem but a bunch of abandoned buildings and some challenging looking people. He said to me, don't you see the opportunities that we have to rebuild? Don't you see the opportunities that we have to save this community, save families, and win people for Christ? Now, I'm thinking that I'm missing something because it was obvious that the, I, I was seeing something totally different than what he was seeing. The issue was both of us saw the exact same thing. However, how we interpreted what we saw was totally different. 
I saw obstacles. Dr. Butts saw opportunities. I saw problems. He saw possibilities. I saw problems. He saw potential. And he told me that this is the problem with many of us. We never see the potential because most of us can never get past the obstacles long enough to see the opportunities. Most of us, we only see problems and not possibilities. Why? Because it takes vision to see opportunities. It takes vision to see past problems. It takes vision. And he said to me, young man, you have a vision problem. He gave me a few words. Vision means to envision something, to see far beyond the physical realm of present reality. Its ability to see something that can be, to see something as it can be and not as it is. In fact, vision is really the ability to see God's presence to perceive God's power and to focus on God's plan in spite of the obstacles. I say to you, boss, what do you see? He goes on to share with me the greatest gift ever given to humanity is not the gift of sight. The greatest gift is the gift of vision because sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. Eyes that can see past problems, past obstacles, eyes that can see potential in any situation is rare. What do you see, beloved? This question is important because most of us lack the ability to see. Most of us lack vision, beloved. And the Bible says in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people will surely perish. Do you realize that most people are lost? And most people are missing their moment. Most people are missing their season, their promised land experience. Do you realize most people are missing their blessings because they can't see God moving? They can see everything else. They can see every problem. They can see every obstacle, but they cannot see God's hand at work. That's why Isaiah said, I will do a new thing. Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? Most of us are missing the very move of God because we don't have faith enough to see beyond our situation to trust God. If you don't believe me that this is a problem, beloved, I'd like to call your attention to our text this morning. The 13th chapter of the book of Numbers. This chapter talks about a critical event in the history of Israel. And I believe that it is relevant for us today because the way the children of Israel reacted too often is the way that we react. And particularly in our churches, what they saw is too often what we see. Many times, beloved, for some reason, we just have a vision problem. What do you see? At this point in Israel's history, they had come a mighty long way, but not all the way. They had come out of Egypt, but they were not yet into the Canaan land. They were pilgrims of the Lord, yet not possessors of the land. They had manna in the morning and quail in the evening, but they had yet to taste the milk and honey of God's promised land. After their long trek out of Egypt, we meet them at Kadesh Barna, the outskirts of Canaan, actually the suburbs of the promised land. Moses informs the anxious people that it is now time to inhabit the land that God promised. But we know that in Deuteronomy, the first chapter and the 22nd verse, it informs us that during this meeting, there was quarreling and confusion. Mm -hmm. the, people, the people wanted more information about the inhabitants and occupants of the land. 
The Bible says that Moses took their advice and formed a research committee consisting of 12 men from the 12 tribes of Israel. He asked these men to bring back information on the land and the people. Now, when they had concluded their mission, the Bible says a follow-up meeting was convened and Moses called on the research committee to report on its findings. Now, I can imagine what it was like at the meeting. Moses said, brothers, what do you see? Now, all 12 of the spies brought back word that the land was as good as the Lord had said. They confirmed that the land indeed flowed with milk and honey, and I'm sure there was a lot of amens and a lot of praise God. But wait, what else did you see? It does flow with milk and honey, and brother pastor, it is beautiful, but, hmm, but, don't you hate that word, but? Don't you hate that word, but? It doesn't matter what kind of meeting I'm in. It doesn't matter how happy I am. No matter how excited I am, there is that word, but. There is that conjunction that tries to mess up my function. And beloved, for some reason, I seem to always attract those kinds of people. We like you, Pastor Griffin, but. You're doing a good job, Pastor, but. You are gifted in all that, but. It sounds like a wonderful idea, but. And beloved, if we're not careful, this conjunction can kill our confidence. This conjunction can zap our creativity. This conjunction can kill our moment, and it can stop us from going into our promised land experience. Lord, how many times have I heard this? I know that God has power, Pastor, but I know that God said we can do all things, but I know that we need to do it, but I know that you the pastor and all that, and I know you mean well, but now you got to know sometimes the word but does have some advantages. Mm-hmm. Nice church, but the people are stuck in the past. Oh, I ain't going to get no help in here today. Sometimes that conjunction can help us. Because what happens, that conjunction can keep us out of trouble. But I have learned that if we're going to make it into our destiny, into our promised land experience, we can never allow the conjunction to stop our function. If God told us to do something, you got to go on despite the conjunction. You have to learn to function despite the conjunction. Yes, it does flow with milk and honey, but the people who dwell in there are strong. They dwell in walled cities with advanced technology, a strong civilization, and the inhabitants are giants. In fact, we seem like grasshoppers compared to them. You got to know, beloved, that they concluded in a nutshell, despite the fact that God told them the land was theirs, they concluded that it couldn't be done. Even when Caleb jumped up in the meeting and said, Bro, Pastor, I make a motion. I move that we go up at once and possess the land for we are well able to overcome it. That's when the meeting began to get out of hand. Ten of the committee members shouted, uh, stood up and shouted to Caleb, we can't do this. We are ill-equipped. We're ill-prepared, ill-qualified. It's too dangerous. In fact, we need to let the people know that Pastor Moses and that crazy Rev Reverend Caleb are about to get us all killed. In fact, I told you we should have stayed in Egypt. Somebody ought to call a meeting. We ought to put together a search committee so that we can get somebody who can take us back to Egypt. Beloved, the people were trapped in the sand. Do you know people who are literally trapped in the sand? 
they so trapped in the same, they get up the same way every morning. Eat the same thing. Leave the house the same way. Drive the same route to church. Park in the same spot. Come through the same door. Speak to the same people. Sit in the same seat. Shout off the same song every time. Fall asleep at the same time in the service. Wake up at the same time. Give the same offering every Sunday. Get up and say the same way, say goodbye to the same people, go out the same door the same way. They are the same. And if you try to change them, they will turn around and remind you of how they love things to be the same. In fact, they are so addicted to the same that they need to go to what? To Samaholics Anonymous and say, hello, my name is Bob, and I'm a Samaholic. Because they're addicted to the same, beloved. And we've got to understand that for those of us who have been driven insane by the same, that we are not going to stand with it because God does something new every day. Morning by morning, new mercies do we see. So, Lord, do something new in me. So we've learned three things from their situation. You've got to learn, beloved, so that you could see God's movement and so that you can make it into your promised land experience. Three short things. One is don't minimize our God. Because here's the thing in the text. When we minimize God, we in turn maximize our problems. Because you got to understand the whole matter of giants in the text was more of perception than reality. What do you mean? What do you mean? This is what happens when we minimize God. The Bible scholars tell us that the word anak does not mean giant, it means people who had long necks. So these people were not necessarily big, they were just different. It was literally a vision thing. And it's funny how people who lack vision will always minimize God but maximize the problems. The giants are in the land, there are giants in the land. But I want you to notice in the text that God is nowhere in the report of the research team that was sent to Canaan. I want you to notice that God does not appear in their analysis, God does not appear in their logic, nor does God appear in their proposal. This tragic minimization of the power of God resulted in the maximization of their problems. After all, the report did start out well, but it just got progressively worse. In fact, the longer anyone excludes God from their plans, the problem will grow proportionately larger and larger. You got to see in the text, beloved, in verse 28, they saw the children of Anak along with a mixture of other cultures and people. By the time they got to verse 32, all the inhabitants in the land are taller than them. By the time they got to verse 33, these Anak Anak are now descendants of giants. It's like they're wearing 3D glasses and everything is getting bigger and bigger. The problem is growing until they have internalized the problem itself. Then they start having a we can't do it mentality. No wonder they look like grasshoppers to the inhabitants of the land. When you think like a grasshopper, you begin to act like a grasshopper. When you walk like a grasshopper, you begin to look like a grasshopper. See, once we see ourselves as grasshoppers, we see ourselves as powerless, the battle is already over. We are already defeated. But notice the text does not say they were grasshoppers. It says that they saw themselves as grasshoppers after looking at the giants. Sometimes, beloved, we can forget that God is still in charge. Sometimes we can forget that God has the last word. If these individuals, these group, these children of Israel, if they had just remembered God's mighty works, 
They could have avoided this mess. Oh, how soon we forget. Do you realize they had just witnessed the awesome power of God? They had just been delivered from slavery from the most technologically, militarily advanced nation at the time, which was Egypt. Do you realize they had witnessed God use lice and locusts and blood and boils? They watched God use frogs and flies and disease and death to defeat Pharaoh's power. How soon we forget. They had just recently been led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. How soon we forget. They had not long ago watched Moses stretch out his rod over the Red Sea and they saw the water part and while they crossed over without even getting mud on their shoes. How soon we forget. This is what happens when we only see the giants but overlook the God. This is what happens when we minimize our God. You got to know in the text, God was not depending on Israel. God wanted Israel to depend on him. Oh, we humans, beloved, we are forgetful people. Even though we have known the Lord on a thousand deliverances, yet every time we get in need, we seem to forget. God has brought you out, out over and over and over again. And yet every time you need a rent, every time you need an opportunity, you seem to forget that God has brought you from a mighty long way. Oh, I think that if we didn't have communion once a month, we would forget that Jesus died for our sins. Oh, I'm glad that we got communion, that, that Jesus left communion in place to jog our memory so that we don't forget how powerful God is. Oh, you got to know if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? It reminded me when I first became the pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. Here I am, a young preacher. I just get there and I'm preaching on Sunday. I'm preaching as hard as I can. And I look up and there was a woman, Mother Dickens, one of the church mothers. You all don't have mothers here, but in our church, we had church mothers. Sat on the second row behind the deacons, all in white. Had a big old hat, looked like a lampshade with different tassels all around. Mother Dickens would get up in the middle of the service. As soon as I'm preaching good, she would get up in the middle of the service and she would turn her back to me. And I'm sitting there saying, oh my Lord, here it is the man of God preaching the word of God to the people of God. And this woman got the nerve to stand up and turn her back to me. I said, what kind of church is this? Uh, you know, and I, I wanted to say something, but I hadn't been there that long. I didn't even know where the bathrooms were. So I didn't want to say nothing to rock the boat or anything. So every Sunday I would just get to preaching and all of a sudden Mother Dickens would turn her back to me. And I said, oh my God, you're the man of God preaching the word of God to the people of God. And she turned her back on me. So one Sunday I got up the nerve and I went over there and I said, Mother Dickens, she said, good word, Pastor. A good word you preach today I said but mother Dick I got a question to ask you I said every time I get to preaching and get good in my stride in preaching you get up and you turn your back to me I, I said how rude is that here the man of God preaching the word of God to the people of God and you turn your back and she looked at me she said oh no pastor I didn't intend for it to be rude I apologize. She said, when you were preaching, I started feeling sad for myself. I, I started realizing that my husband is gone, my children are gone, and my grandchildren are scattered all over the place. And I started to think that I couldn't make it. But then the Lord would tell me to stand up and look back over your life. Turn around and look where God has brought you from. And when you turn around and look where God has brought you from, you'll realize that you got a testimony. And I said, good God from Zion, I know that'll show enough preach. So every now 
and then when you see me in worship and I turn my back to you, it ain't because I'm being rude. It's because I'm looking back over my life and I'm realizing that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Is there anybody in here who say I got to turn my back? I got to turn my, I got to look back over my life. All right, sit down, sit down, sit down. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sit down, sit down. Sit down, sit down. You all making me nervous. Hold on, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. The second thing, and I don't think we're going to get to the third one because you are you all too much for me right now. The second thing is you got to learn that we got to learn this, beloved type. We're going to see the, see the problem that you got to learn. Don't focus on the facts. Focus on the truth. What do you mean? What do you mean? See, as long as you focus on the facts, you will never know the truth. You see, Satan can't do anything about God's power, but he can do something about your faith. He can place stuff in your view to distort the facts so that you begin to believe based on what you see and not on what God said. So Satan puts us in situations where the facts are stacked against us. And because many of us are so factual as opposed to being faithful that we allow our faith to be dictated by the facts. Oh, Lord, have mercy, and not by the truth. And now that the facts are speaking negatively in our lives, in spite of what God has said to us, we don't believe because what we see is not what we heard from God. So the facts make us lose our expectation. It makes us lose our faith. The facts make us believe that it's not our time. It's not our moment. The facts make us believe it's the wrong time to possess the land, the wrong time to go after the blessing. Now, we're almost there, but we don't believe it, nor do we see it because of the facts. Here's the thing, boss, is that we haven't learned the difference between facts and truth. Facts are what we see, but truth is what God said. Do you got to know God's word is truth? God's truth can change the facts, but the facts can't change the truth. Why? Because the truth was established before the foundation of the world. God had the truth even though he knew the facts, but he didn't let the facts stop the truth. And sometimes he will let the facts be the facts so that we can learn the truth, so that we learn, so that we don't walk by facts, but we walk by truth. Let me help somebody in here. The facts are you don't have the resources that you need, uh, but the truth is God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. The facts are the doctors may say you might be sick or whatever, but the truth is we serve a God. God, who is a healer. The facts are they may be trying to stab you in the back at work, but the truth is no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The facts are you may be hurt, but the truth is I serve a God that can heal. Is there anybody in here who see the facts, but you know the truth? You know God is able to do any and everything? Is there anybody in here who say, Lord, the facts I ain't got no money, but the truth is God God has paid my rent every month. God has covered my children. God has covered my finances. Is there anybody in here who know what I'm talking about? I see the facts, but I know the truth. All right. All right. I got, I got, I got 30 seconds. And I'm done. I got, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Keep that. I'm done. 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 Sure, we would just be getting started, but I'm done. 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 So, last thing is sometimes you just got to do it. Hmm. You got to just launch out. And, and the thing about it is Nike has that slogan, just do it. 
Now, the interesting thing, beloved, is that you got to sometimes do it when it doesn't make sense. You got to, do, does anybody know that you can learn a lot of things online, but one thing you can't learn online is how to swim? <laughs> there are no online courses for swimming. You have literally got to get in the water and get wet. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You got to get in the water and you got to get wet. But the problem is, we're like what happened to my son. We, uh, my sons were small. They're now grown now. But my children were small. We, we, I took them to the museum, to the, to the zoo. And what's interesting at the zoo is I saw the African impala. Now, what was interesting, the African impala can jump a distance, it can, jump 12, it can jump a height of 12 feet at a distance of almost 30, right? Now here it is, this thing can jump 12 feet, right? But I didn't realize when we were at the zoo, the, zoo, the, the, the keeper told us, he said, we can encage him as long as the cage, if we can keep him in a walled cage that's three feet. And it doesn't even have to have a top on it. And I said, what do you mean? I said, but wait, wait how, how can you keep him in a wall cage of three feet when it can jump a distance of 12 feet? How does that work? And, and it can jump 12 feet and a distance of almost 30. How can that work? He said, it's simple. The impala will never jump if it can't see where to land. So since it can't see where to land, it remains in prison. And just because it can't see anything, he, he, even though he has the ability to jump out of his situation, he will not jump out of it because he can't see it. You sitting there looking at me all funny, but there are some of us who realize that God has told you to do something. I need to see it. I need to understand it. Where is it? I need to feel it. I need the money. I need the opportunity. I need some sign. I need this. I need that. And God is telling you, jump, and you won't jump. And so you remain in a prison because you don't want to make the decision to jump. Oh, you know what? But see, what we need to be is like the locusts. The locusts, lo you, you, you ever see the locusts? They're like the grasshoppers. They're, like, they're locusts, right? In the biblical days, I didn't know. I used to see on the movies where the swarm of locusts would fly in and devour everything, right? I didn't realize until I was watching this on the Discovery Channel, I was watching that locusts have wings, but they can't fly. I didn't know that. I said, well, how does the locust get to where it needs to go? And I didn't realize that what the locust do is the locust positions itself and waits for the wind to come along and then expands its wings and the wind will take it to wherever it wants to go. Oh, you ain't hearing what I'm saying. So the, the locust don't know where it's going. It totally relies on the what? On the wind. And I said, oh my God, we don't need to be like the impala. We need to be like the locust. We need to position ourselves. And we need to position ourselves. And when the Lord says move, we need to position. Oh, you, you used to, anybody in here used to jump rope? You know what I'm talking about. You used to jump rope. And you wait, you wait for the timing, for the right time. And then you just jump right in it. Is there anybody in here who know what I'm talking about? You just jumping into it. You can't see it. You don't understand. But all you know is, is that you are following the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 